Bismillah walhamdulillah wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man ihtada bihada wa nashadu an la ilaha illallah wa ahdahu la sharika la wa nashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu Allahumma la ilma lana illa ma allamtana innaka anta la alimul hakim Allahumma allimna ma yanfa'na wa anfa'na bima allamtana wa zidna ilma وارزقنا فحم النبيين وحفظ المرسلين اللهم افتح إلينا حكمتك وانشر علينا رحمتك يا ذا الجلال والإكرام وصل اللهم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله الكرام ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم بسم الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته today is our uh, sixth session and uh, it it's it's one of those um, the the day of of the of the Ramadan is not so much as the count as much as the night preceding it, and we're going to talk about uh, time inshallah in the next session. But I just thought I'd bring that out to um, because a lot of the masajid are going to be talking about the twenty seventh night being Layla to Qadr, and it's almost as though they have vetoed this element here to say as a universal, as, as a fundamental, as, as constitutional that the 27th night, uh, they have almost established it as Qatay, which is really taking the, is really taking Islam to the boundaries of extremity in this regard. So uh, you, the Prophet وسلم, did mention in a few hadith, which are Sahih hadith, that the 27th is the night. And in some other hadith, he also did say, which are also Sahih hadith, that it is not the 27th night only. It is one of the odd number of nights, or it falls in the last 10 nights of Ramadan, which is why the last 10 are really regarded as the, the you know, with, with higher esteem, because it is among these last 10 nights that Laylatul Qadr would occur. And all of the ulama, all the four imam of the four madhab, none of them ever gave a qat'i uh, definitive statement saying that it is the 27th night and no other night. In fact, they all affirmed that it would be in either of these 10 nights, you see. And uh, Imam Abu Hanifa even suggested that Laylatul Qadr could possibly occur on any night of the year because of this time uh, count shift that takes place, right? So you sp it, it's all based on sighting of the moon. So some people will experience Laylatul Qadr on, on an odd night. Others might experience it on an even night. It's not even necessarily on an even night or an odd night. Yeah, so the idea here is that you should seek out the night of power. You shouldn't just mark it on your calendar and then say, this is the night. Okay, this is the night I'm going to stay awake and I'm going to do my tasbih and I'm going to go to the mosque and I'm going to do ABCD. You see, you see, it's a night that you have to look out for. You have to seek it. And this is what the hadith says, seek out or seeking out of Laylatul Qadr, right? So, inshallah. I hope you guys will not fall into this category or this modus of, you know, just regarding this as a qatay thing because I've seen some of the masajid do that. They make this the one night of utter celebration and it's celebration rather. Whatever they're doing, it's a celebratory thing. You have food and you have all these presentations that take place and then they want to have a khatam Quran on the same night as though, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, deadline that they have to meet, <laughs> you know, and then they want to do fundraising as well. So, you know, be careful of falling into these elements because then they just become bid'ah. You know, it's not really, that's not the purpose of Laylatul Qadr. The purpose of Laylatul Qadr is truly to find that night in which you have a complete connection, which is why the Hajjud should be done on all the nights. Recitation of Quran should be done on all the nights. Any ibadat that you do should be done on any of these last 10 nights. So that whichever night Laylatul Qadr might fall under, whether it's an odd night or an even night, you may get it. Right? Anyway, Laylatul Qadr brings together a unique aspect because we said that the 
you have you have the lunar cycle which is the mulkia aspect of this motion of the moon going around them all around the earth and then in this mulkia aspect there is a crux there is that one month or that one cycle which is really the crucible of this mulkia and then in this crucible there is that's one night which is now the night of light or is as, as it is called the night of power but it is night the night of light because the light itself has been sent down on this night the quran which is the nur which is which is one of its name a nur the quran is nur and so right at the crucible inside the crucible of abstinence you have this point of light which is really now the being of this entire domain so you in this allegory or this comparative you the being are this point of light who has been placed inside this crucible of abstinence and has been shrouded in multitudes of layers which are number one they are protective layers against this world of causality in which evil and falsehood exists and number two they are also veils which prevent you from seeing this ultimate reality so you are in this in this really in this uh layered <laughs> hub this crucible of abstinence in this layered hub and you are this point of light now this point of light is not self illuminating it does not in other words it does not generate its own energy it has to be sustained you understand because if it was self illuminating then it could have brought itself into being but it didn't it had to be brought into being and therefore whoever brought it into being is the one responsible for sustaining it is the one responsible for keeping it ignited he is the one who can power it and if this is a point of light then its sustenance can only be light because you don't feed light with anything else to keep it alive it has to be light that sustains it so now we want to understand where is this light coming from to sustain this being now we're not talking about as far as life or death sustenance is concerned we're talking about existential yani being existent what is this being when it is existent in its purpose of existence how would it be fulfilled if it did not receive this light because this world and all the worlds are a composite of two aspects you have light and you have darkness you understand you have this this um aspect of knowing and then you have this aspect of ignorance you have this aspect of warmth and then you have this aspect of cold so each of these elements on this side that i've highlighted light warmth knowledge all these elements are elements that have substance that have form that have meaning that have purpose these are some things now when i'm saying thing i'm not meaning i don't mean a physical thing now we are talking about thing in terms of that which is in existence right we're not talking about a physical object a thing that is in existence as a thing then on this side you've got things like darkness cold ignorance on this side you've got justice on this side you've got zulm you've got injustice and you'll find that zulm serves as the root word for injustice and for darkness because injustice is a, injustice is a mode of darkness it is a mode of covering it is a mode of shrouding it is a mode of purging you see 
Now, if you want, if you examine these two elements here, you find that this element, these elements have got substance, form, meaning, purpose. But these elements don't have any form. They don't have substance. They don't have meaning. They don't have purpose. These are what you would call nothings. These are the nothings. These are the somethings. These are those that have value, intrinsic value. These are those that whose value is determined by other things. So darkness really is a non-existent entity in that it is not a thing. When I say non-existent in this, in this category now, when I'm speaking about non-existence here, we're not talking about the non-existence we discussed in the last session. Okay, now this is where the English language is, a, is an issue, you see, because you don't have the terminology in the English language to really describe these elements. But in the Arabic language, you have these terminologies to describe the difference between hadir and wujud, you see, and then dahir and batin. And so you have all these terms that you can use in the Arabic language. But since we are, we, this is an English session, so well, I'm just going to try my best to give you a distinction. Here, we're not using non-existence in the same capacity as we talked about non-existence in the previous session, where a thing just isn't there. It's not there. Whether it's a, a thing, nothing, something, anything, everything, it's not a thing. It's not there. And then Allah brings it into existence. Now it is a thing, but it is nothing because it doesn't have form, substance, meaning and purpose. Then it becomes something, right? So we're not talking about that. Here we're saying that this is a non-existent entity in that it is not a thing with substance, form, meaning or purpose. All that darkness is, in, in the same way that we spoke about a horizon, we said that a horizon is an abstract reality. It is abstract. It is a reality. It's not that it doesn't exist, but it's not a physical thing, right? Darkness falls in, in that category. What darkness is, is an absence of light. In the same way that cold is a non-existent entity, cold is, a, is an absence of, of warmth or heat. There's no such thing as cold. It's just a term that we have used to associate that with. Because what you might describe as cold isn't what a polar bear might describe as cold or a penguin describe as cold <laughs> or whoever experiences that minus temperature. What you might call cold living in, say, South America isn't what an Eskimo living in Alaska will describe as cold. You see, these are, it's a relative aspect. So it's not, it's not a defined entity. All that cold is, is an absence of warmth or heat. Injustice, likewise, is an absence of justice because justice is an active element. It's not passive. You do not enact justice passively on people or in your environment or even within yourself. It is an active thing. It is a conscious thing. So when you take justice away, now you're left with dhulm. You're left with injustice. And likewise, ignorance is an absence of knowledge. That's what ignorance is. Where knowledge does not exist, ignorance prevails. But ignorance is not, a, is not an existing entity in that sense. It's not a thing. See, knowledge is something that has substance. It has intrinsic value. Ignorance does not. It's hollow. It's empty. It's like a void. Right? So what is emptiness? Emptiness is a lack of something that is to be filled. It, it, it is empty because it doesn't have anything. It doesn't have anything of substance or form in it. It's a void because it's empty. You see, a vacuum is what? It's a void because it's empty. It's vacant. So light is that which has substance. Darkness is that which has no substance. What is light then in this case? If you assume that light is what's coming from the bulb or coming from the window or from the sun or from the moon or any such source as this physical world, 
you will be wrong in your understanding of what light truly is. This is just what Ghazali says is an arbitrary word. It is a word that you have associated with something that is fulfilling the property of light. Because what that light is doing when you switch on this, press the switch or you open the curtains and then there's light coming in. What that thing is doing, that light, is it's, it's revealing unto you what was originally kept concealed by darkness. That's what light is. Light in its inherent property is that it is something that reveals that which is kept concealed, that which is in darkness. And so this is what our, our scholars, our scientists in our tradition they theorize as a, as, a, as a completely radical position against what was the dominant opinion in Newtonian physics. Well, it wasn't Newtonian at the time because Newton wasn't born yet. But what was, we would say, is the physical world or physics of the physical world at that time or prior to that. Scholars like Ptolemy, um, and others would propose and propose that the way we see things is by light emitting from our eyes, like a torch, and then it shines on things. And that's how we see objects. Ibn Haytham was one of the first who, who opposed that view. And it is an opposition of a radical shift. He said no, and he proved it. He proved it from where? He proved it from the Quran. He said, no, light does not come from the eyes because the human being is not an a self-illuminating object. It does not generate light. Rather, light is what comes from external environs, bounces off an object, and then enters into the eyes. That's how we see things. Now, where did they get this knowledge from? Our scholars. They got it from the Quran. And this, we say, is one of those many kinds of knowledges that can only be delivered through revelation, not through human concoction. Human beings, there are certain things that no matter how smart, how intelligent, how much information, the nth degree of what knowledge is accumulated of the entire human race, there are certain things that they simply cannot work out. This was one of those. In knowing how it is that we are able to see or how it is that our senses truly work. And they'll argue and they'll say, yeah, we would have eventually figured out even if Ibn Haytham was not there. We would have eventually figured it out. Like we meaning them, the Europeans. <laughs> they would have figured it out eventually. Sure, okay. <laughs> But you didn't, <laughs> right? <laughs> we did. And our source of knowledge did not come from Ibn Haytham just working it out. It came primarily from this ayah that we're going to look at today. It is known as ayah to nur and it describes the process through which light enters the human being from two aspects, from two directions. And this light is, we're not talking about the light itself. We're talking about that which is revealed because that is what light does. Light reveals that which is concealed. And this is why the Quran is called a nur because it is a revelation. It is revealing that which was not known. And this is what knowledge does. It makes known what is unknown because what is unknown is kept in darkness. This is why you cannot see the future because the future unfolding is something that has been kept in darkness. So the nature of this light, this nur, is that it is revealing unto the human being what the human being does not know, so that he can then facilitate a knowing which would take him to knowledge, which that then will take him to ma'rifa. Now, there's an interesting dynamic that takes place here. The process of knowledge coming into the human being is one source of light. The process of ma'rifa 
or that knowledge turning into ma'rifah is another source of light. So we say that there are two sources of knowledge. They say that there are only one source of knowledge. They say that this knowledge of the human being is acquired only through sensoria and the sensory world, through your senses. We say that knowledge is acquired through the senses, yes, but that knowledge is limited. Why? Because the physical world of senses is also limited. It's finite. Everything in this realm has a beginning and an end. There's only so much of a thing that you can possibly know. And that takes you to a point of, well, that's it. There's nothing else to know about this. But when you acknowledge that there is another source of knowledge, then the knowing of that alam, this world, extends now. There is something more to it that you cannot see, that your senses cannot see, that your senses cannot pick up. There is more to it. That's that other knowledge. How is that other knowledge acquired? It is acquired through revelation. Why? Because this world cannot explain itself. That's a principle. This realm and everything in it cannot explain itself. The law of gravity, as they call it, cannot explain itself. The constants which are defined in physics, the principles that are defined in chemistry, the, 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 the fundamentals that are defined in biologics or biology, they cannot explain themselves. They need an external source to explain them. So the, 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 the idea that there is displacement in this world, that, that, that we know that there is displacement because there is space, then there is motion through space. So there is a displacement of objects moving through space. That displacement cannot explain itself. It cannot tell you why it exists. In other words, I cannot tell you why I exist by myself, by my own concoction. This object, every object in creation, the stone, the tree, it cannot tell you why it exists. Its explanation can only come from an external source. Why? Because when you look at the regression, of the current point in time of the physical world of this of this universe for instance let's leave the samawat let's only talk about the physical world right now when you look at the regression it goes back to what we understand as the primordial particle or the point origin so all these constants and these laws that we have in our textbooks that we have defined we have given these names gravity we have given these names this is it's not it's not actually what it is. It's just what we have named it. So it is arbitrary in that sense. But when we say arbitrary, we don't mean that it is completely baseless. Arbitrary means that there is some authority that has also applied or, uh, or has gone into the making of that. So when we say that some words are arbitrary, it means that there's still an authority there, but it has been made by mankind. That's what we mean by arbitrary. That, that authority is just as far as mundane matters are concerned. It's not a supreme authority that has ordained it. Okay, that's why we call it arbitrary. It's on this level. So all these laws are arbitrary. If you go back to that point origin, you find that these laws did not exist until that point origin had an expansion, what they call the Big Bang. Okay, there was an expansion. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says we parted the heavens and the earth, they were joined and then we parted them. And some Muslims have said, yeah, see, the Quran talks about Big Bang and all that. The Quran does not talk about the Big Bang. Use this a little bit and approach the Quran and regard it with respect. The Quran does not talk about the Big Bang theory. They talk about the Big Bang theory. It's their terminology and their theory. That's not what the Quran is talking about. The Quran is using its terminology, therefore use those terminologies that are given by the Quran. Use the theory that has been given by the Quran. Don't talk about them and all oh, the Quran is verified. No. 
That's stupidity. That is a lack of intellection. And you think that you sound smart, but you don't. You actually sound very foolish when you say that. That the Quran is verifying now. The Quran is, oh, these theories, now scientists are discovering this and scientists. Now science tells us this now. The Quran says this, now science is telling us this. That's a very stupid and very foolish manner of speech. Astaghfirullah, I'm fasting, but I need to make this matter clear because people are dumb this way. That is not a mark of an, of an intelligent Muslim. It is not. And this is why we say, when you look at our scholars and the way they spoke, this is why they were regarded in high esteem. Ibn Haytham, when he gave his theory in his book of optics regarding how light bounces off and enters into our eyes, he did not say that Quran is verifying what science is saying. You will not find those kinds of statements in his kitabs, in his books, or in any of our scholarly books. So don't speak like that. The heavens and the earth were joined. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we parted them. At that point of partition is now when all these other rules and laws that he ordained were put into place, which means at the point of when they were still together, these rules and laws did not exist. What we call the constants in physics. They are, const they are called constants because they are constant. They're not changing. Like the speed of light is a constant. The speed of light does not change. You see, gravity is a constant. The pull of gravity, which is usually given the unit measure of 10, okay, or 9.8 others give, is the same. It doesn't change. So, if these constants did not exist at the point origin, they couldn't have existed before the point origin. Could they? <laughs> and in order for these constants to exist, which means they themselves are contingent on the prime, ori prime origin, the point origin, then the point origin which has been now brought into existence and then there's this expansion that takes place, these objects, these constants, henceforth begin to exist. They cannot exist by their own independence because if they existed by their own independence, they could have existed before the point origin. You could have had gravity before that. You could have had speed before that, displacement vector before that. But those are moot points. Why? Because there was no space. There was no time or time is for, so far as physicality is concerned. There was no matter. You needed all these three. You needed these three ingredients at the point origin in order for everything else to take effect. Because if you only had time and space and no matter, what would you put there? If you only had space and matter and no time, when would you put it? And if you only had time and matter, but no space, where would you put it? <laughs> so you needed these three, you see, which means these constants existed post of the creation of the heavens and the earth. They didn't exist before that, which means they didn't exist independently. If they existed independently, then they could explain themselves. In the same way that if mankind existed independently, you could explain yourself insofar as your non-existence was concerned and then your existence was concerned. And we say that you cannot comprehend non-existent because you are an existent being. You cannot comprehend that because you have never been conscious in that state. Therefore, you can't explain yourself in either state of prior to being nothing and then being something. Same case applies to all these laws and principles. Therefore, these elements can only be explained by an external source. Something else has to explain them because they cannot explain themselves. Understand? So, who then becomes the authority to explain these elements? The answer is very simple. The one who originated them. Because if you have a prime origin, then you must have an originator. 
This is what we call in, in the Kalam argument, a necessary cause. If you have an effect already there, then you must have a necessary cause preceding the effect. And this we don't mean cause and effect in so, like physicality is concerned, cause effect, okay? Like I do this, right? That sound is the effect of me doing this. That's a cause and effect. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about a necessary cause, that which initiates everything, that which originates any, everything. Allah, Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, He is the originator of the heavens and the earth. Fatiru samawati wal He is the originator. So this prime origin has to have an originator, which means this originator is well aware of what he is originating, which means only he can explain what it is that he is placing there. Therefore, the knowledge of what these things pertain and everything else that is now cumulative of this prime origin can only come from an external source. Now, why is it an external source? Because this prime origin now is hence created to be a closed loop system. This is what we call the universe in physics is called a closed loop system. And it is in this closed loop system, so long as it is closed loop, then the laws of thermodynamics make sense. Laws of thermodynamics are fundamental laws of the universe's nature or characteristic or function, the way it works. For example, one of the laws states that energy can neither be created or destroyed. It can only be transferred. That statement only holds true so long as you're talking about a closed loop system. Because the question mark always arises, well, understandable, it can't be created within the system, meaning the system itself cannot create its own energy. And because it can't create its own energy, it cannot destroy the energy. It can only transfer the energy. So when you press the switch on the wall, there is potential energy in you, kinetic energy as well. You click the switch and then now there's electromagnetic energy flowing through and then it reaches the bulb where there's the filament, then there is heat energy and then there is luminance from that. So that energy is transferred from you. It goes there, it goes there, it goes there, it goes there, it comes out. And then that heat energy dissipates into the air. So then that radiation then converts again. It is absorbed by something else. So your body would absorb that heat energy and then that would be turned into something else. So this is what it means. There is a closed circuit here. That energy can only flow. So the question mark here arises, where does the energy come from? You see? The law of entropy, for example, can only hold true insofar as a closed loop system is concerned, because the idea of things moving between order and chaos is not just a random motion. The actual direction of things where things are moving from a certain order into a certain chaos or a certain chaos into a certain order has to be instigated. So for them to rationalize these, they have made it that it only uh, is possible uh, rather, they only make sense, these laws only make sense in a closed loop system. So because it is a closed loop system, its knowledge cannot be explained by itself. In the same way that it cannot generate its own energy, it cannot bring about its own luminance, it has to come from an external source. That external source is the creator. And he is external because he is not bound by these laws. He is not bound by the universe. He is not bound by these elements. That doesn't mean he is not harder. He is not present in he's, because he is omnipresent, but he is not affected by the nature of this world, of this dunya, of this universe. He is not affected by cardinal coordinates, by up and down, left and right. He is not affected by time, by pressure, by mass, volume, by displacement, vector, speed. You see, he is not affected by gravity. He's not affected by all these elements because he, thumma stawa al-arsh, he rose above the throne. And thus, 
It is the throne that governs everything below it. Since the Ard, which is the universe, is the lowest of the low, then you've got the Samawat, which is part of the Malakut. So this is the Mulk. The Ard is the Mulk. Then you've got the Samawat, part of the Malakut. And then you've got the Jabarut, which is Noor. And then you've got the furthest point, which is the Lot tree. And then you've got above and beyond that, you've got his Arsh. That Arsh is what commands everything. The Amr begins from the Arsh. And then he is above the Arsh, which means he is also above the Amr. You understand now? So when he speaks, his speech is truth unaffected by anything along this line in hierarchy. We're not talking about up and down like floor and ceiling. In hierarchy of power and sovereignty and authority, it is the truth undisturbed. Therefore, it is the purest form of revelation when it is revealing that which the closed system cannot reveal of itself. It is revealing that which the closed system cannot reveal itself. This is what is meant by this ayah that we will look at in which he says, Allahu nuru samawati wal ard. He Allah is the light, the nur of the heavens and the earth, which means he alone is the revealer of all things pertaining in this world. Because anything in this world cannot reveal about itself. And this is the unique aspect here. Allah can reveal about himself. We're not talking about personality, traits, behaviors, those kind of things. I can reveal about myself. I can say, you know, I like this and I like that. I don't like this. I don't like that. Those are things of my preferences, right? That's not the revelation we're talking about here. The revelation we're talking about here in him revealing himself compared to humans revealing him themselves is that I cannot tell you what I am made of, where I come from in, in the most particulate. For instance, somebody can argue right down to the cellular level. Well, we can then ask the question after that, where did that cell come from? What is it made of? Oh, it's made of matter. Yeah, but where does it come from? Where does that matter come from? They'll explain it and say it's stardust or cosmic dust, whatever. <laughs> it's got this uh, this chemical composition, that chemical composition. This. But what is it really? That's the question you want to ask. Where did it come from? Right? Allah says he created mankind from clay, from teen. What is this teen, this clay? Because there is what you call matter and then there's what you understand as elements. So there's an element that makes the matter. This is a different discussion altogether, but we'll talk about that another day. So you know how they speak about um, things like fire, water, earth, which is also clay and air. These are elements. These are the essential aspects from which the other matter is made. Right? Where does that come from? Who made that? <laughs> how, how does that come? See, when you start going into the innermost aspects of your being, whether it's a physical or the metaphysical aspects, really, you cannot explain yourself. You cannot explain your nature. Why are human beings like that? Why, why do we stand upright? Why do human beings do that? You can't explain it. You can't sit. No philosopher can sit and work it out. It's not a rational thing. Its explanation can only come from the one who created it. It's in the same way that a, a VCR or, or, or a radio or, or something or even this device that you have, it cannot explain itself. It can, give you on, it can only give you information that it has been programmed to give. So you can Google search. How does a phone work? And the phone will display that information to you. But that information did not come from the device. 
It came from human input. The human being who made the device is the one who put up all that information regarding the device. The same concept applies. The one who created everything is the one who can explain everything. If you want to know, and, and a state of knowing is desirous by the heart. A state of not knowing puts the being in a state of agitation. And we say that psychologically speaking, the human being's most agitated state, leave the disorders aside, leave all those things aside, the disorders, the depression and the anxiety and all those things, keep those on the side. Those are mundane compared to this one state. This one state, your most agitated, your most confounding, the thing that can truly destroy you internally is a state of not knowing, is a state of ignorance. Because if you don't know, if you don't, if you're not even able to anticipate the next moment, because we said you have five senses, right? One of those is the estimative faculty, internal senses. There's the estimative faculty that enables you to measure spatially in terms of space and also temporally in terms of time. It allows you to measure a little bit ahead like you can anticipate certain events that would occur as necessary events or possible events. Like you know that you'll open your fast uh, today at Maghrib. That's, that's a certainty you can have some conviction in, meaning your heart can cling to that. If your heart cannot cling to anything, imagine you didn't know anything and you're a conscious being, but you can't know anything. Imagine that, it's very difficult because Remember, there are things that you cannot comprehend. You can conceptualize, but you can't comprehend because of your state of existence. So it really, it's, it takes a lot of thought to really put yourself in that mode to think, whoa, what if it was like that? What would happen to me? What if you were in a state of not knowing? You were conscious, but you couldn't know. And, and there was a barrier between your heart and the external senses or any senses. You were suspended in limbo in timelessness or spacelessness, for example, in a state of purgatory, a barzakh kind of a state, what would your hal be? It would drive you insane. It would completely destroy you. That is your most agitated state, is a state of not knowing. This is why the prime advice or counsel or wisdom from the Quran is to always pursue knowledge. Because knowledge will bring you closer to enlightenment. The more you know, the more light is shed upon things that are unknown, the more enlightened you become. And, and, and I gave that example of ilm, amal, and lama, right? Same trilateral root system. Knowledge, when it is properly executed and implemented, will, will make you brilliant, it will make you glow. It will make you shine. This is illuminance now. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that He is the light of the heavens and the earth. He is the one who reveals. Whether it's this way or it's that way. Whether it's through the physical world or it is through revelation. He is the one who reveals. This is why we say all knowledge is attributed to Him. All knowledge is attributed to Him. You cannot say, oh, only religious knowledge is attributed to him or only revelation because the Quran is from him. Physics is not from him or mathematics is not from him. Accounting is not from him. No, it is from him. It is whether it's directly or contingently, it will come from him. You can maybe not establish what's known as the causal nexus between them. The causal nexus is the causal link because you can't establish causal link between things. Or the, or the extent of the links, how long the chain goes, it's there. You are always in a chain of transmission. Whether that chain of transmission is from demonic sources or angelic sources. And either of these sources 
a creation of Allah. He created the demons and he created the angels. So whether your knowledge comes from the demonic sources or it comes from revelation or it comes from passive sources, which can be either or, it is still contingently on him, which is why he is, as he says, Allahu nuru samawati wal ard. He is the nur or the light of the heavens and the earth. But how do you conceptualize this? You can't comprehend it. It's not something you can rationalize because this is beyond rationality. It's not something that you can rationalize. So don't even try to do that. How do you comprehend this? He gives you a mannerism in which you can at least formulate an understanding of sorts. Because, and he is revealing this unto you now. He gives you an allegory. And this allegory is structured in a manner that appeals to your intellection. The way he has created your intellect, intellect to function so that you can understand it. And he says in that ayah, Allah presents examples like these for mankind's understanding. So he's presenting it to you in a manner that will help you understand. And the order in which he has laid out these components as allegories to explain that which you cannot really give any tangible aspects or physical attributes. The, the algorithm that he has explained is precisely the algorithm in which you acquire knowledge or with, through which this light comes into you to make known that which is unknown, whether it is through physicality or it is through revelation. So listen to his words now. We're going to go step by step, phrase by phrase. Mathalu nurihi, he says, an allegory of this light, of his light. Um, just one small example. So there are many different modes of how this light of Allah encompasses the heavens and the earth. And every creature has a different mode of encompassing it. So the example he's giving here is your example. How does the human being engage with this light? Different parts of creation engage differently. And this is why the Muslims affirm a belief that everything is conscious. There is no such thing. Consciousness exists throughout. The, the Western world, the secularists and the atheists and the nihilists, they all think, oh, no, there's no such thing as consciousness. Muslims affirm that consciousness is everywhere. Everything is conscious, even the, even the planets, even the stars, even the sun, every pebble, every stone, every particle, every drop, every leaf, every branch, everything is conscious. And the Quran affirms it. Everything in the heavens and the earth is subservient to Allah is in constant glorification of Allah, is in constant praise of Allah. For it to be doing that, it has to be conscious. So everything is conscious, which means everything has an algorithm, as we spoke about in language. Everything is in communication. The mode of communication is not the same as the human being, which is why you don't understand that. You don't understand how birds communicate. You don't understand how mice communicate how the ants communicate. Suleiman was gifted this. He was gifted this ability to understand how the, the, the animals communicate. But it's not limited only to the animals. Everything else is in communication with each other. You see? So everything else, because it's in communication with each other and because they are conscious, everything has a, an algorithm or a kaifia of how this light enters into them to reveal what Allah intends to be revealed unto everything else. So the example that's been given here is the example of the human being. Now, how does the human being do this? So Mathalu Nurihi, an example, an allegory of this, of his light, Kamishkat is like you have a niche in the wall. So you have a crack in the wall. And now there's light going inside it. So imagine a dark room and then there is a crack on the wall and there's a light source outside this crack. That light is coming in through this crack. 
فيها فيها مسبح inside now this niche where in fiha means now inside now this space inside this room there is a misbah there is a lamp al misbah fi zujajatin this misbah this lamp is inside a glass sphere az zujajatu ka annaha kawkabun durriyun this sphere of glass is as if it were a brilliant pearl or a brilliant star or a brilliant planet or a celestial body that is glowing yuqadu min shajaratin mubarakatin zaytunatin its luminous is not by itself it is illuminated by another source and this is what we said remember it's the external source that illuminates what is in here <laughs> because we are everything in this world is not self generating of light because it, meaning it cannot explain itself look the luminance comes from external so it this glass sphere is been is is illuminated by a tree that is blessed of the olive of the of the blessed olive tree la shaqiyatin wa la gharbiyatin it is not of the east nor of the west meaning it's not from this world it's not of this world it is outside this world sharqia and gharbia this is a way of saying uh, an, a, 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 a rhetorical way of saying it's not from a world where you can develop any form of cardinal coordination to point in any direction that realm where it comes from this direction of up down sideways all this orientation that you have is not of that world what's the property of this of this tree yakadu zaytuha yudiu wa law lam tamsas hunarun this zaytun this olive it glows even though it has not been touched by fire meaning this now this tree is self illuminating it doesn't require fire to ignite it so that it starts glowing nurun ala nur light upon light yahdi allah li nurihi may yasha allah can direct and guide that light unto whomsoever he wills wa yadribu allah al amthal lin nas and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala presents this light uh, sorry presents such examples to whomsoever he astaghfirullah allahumma salli wa sallim alayhi allah subhanahu wa ta'ala presents these examples or such examples for the benefit of mankind's understanding wallahu bi kulli shay'in alim and allah is over all things all knowing and this knowing is the light what's the comparative here First of all two sources of light have been highlighted and both these sources are attributed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala there is the niche and light is coming into the niche and then there is the lamp that is inside the niche and then there is the sphere that is holding this misbah and so now this light that is coming into the niche is illuminating this sphere this zujaja and then where is this light coming from where is its luminance coming from it's coming from this tree that's not of this world it's external which is why the light is coming in through the niche through this opening to come in and illuminate this thing now the lamp is also a lamp it has to be ignited this lamp as imam al ghazali speaks about in his kitab mishkat al anwar and many other scholars have written many other books on just this one aya this is why this aya is so important and it is so magnificent it's so beautiful because it explains the nature of the human being that a human being himself cannot explain it and this is why we say that this knowledge this form of revelation can only be coming in from 
an external source. Only the Creator can give you such kind of knowledge. So there are, in the Quran, there are some ayat which can ex which affirm what human beings already knew, or they are in the process of knowing, or would come to know. Right, like something like embryology was not known in the science of it at the time of the Prophet ﷺ. They understood the general concept of how childbirth takes place and all that. And some of the 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 healers, the the doctors or the tabib at that time, you know, they knew a little bit. But in its minute details, what would la henceforth later be uncovered through scientific experimentation, right? The Quran affirms that this is a knowledge that the human beings can figure out by themselves. And then there is knowledge in the Quran or ayat in the Quran that human beings cannot come to know by themselves unless they go through the ayat, unless they look at the signs, the ayat of the Quran, the knowledge. They study the, uh, the Quran, then they will come to know those things. That's the only way they would come to know that. So this misbah, as Imam al-Ghazali explains, is the lamp of the intellect. It's the intellect. Astaghfirullah. And this intellect is now inside this zujaja, which is the heart. And this heart is a precious entity. It's a celestial being. This heart is a, is, a, is a thing of celestial creation. It's not material. It is a heavenly thing. That's what he says. It's Jawharun Azizun. It's a precious essence. Min Jawharil Malaika. Min Jinsil Jawharil Malaika. From the genus of the angelic es essence. It's from that caliber. It's not a material thing. Now, it is likened to a zujaja. Why? And why is the intellect likened to al-misbah? Because the lamp, when it is turned off, it doesn't benefit anyone. Even the holder of the lamp. If you have a lamp, you're sitting in darkness and you have a lamp and you don't turn it on, it doesn't benefit you. And in the same way that you have an intellect and you're sitting, and what did we say? We likened knowledge to light and ignorance to darkness. You're sitting in ignorance and you have an intellect, but you don't use it. It doesn't benefit you, <laughs> right? This is why we say you have to use it. The intellect has been given to everyone. Everyone has the intellect. Everyone has intelligence in different capacities. The intellect is the same. It's an object. Intellect is the same. It grows as you use it and it diminishes as you neglect it. Intelligence, everyone has been given different intelligences. So in contemporary educational systems, you have something like uh, multiple intelligence uh, theories where some people are more creative and some people are more analytic. So some people are uh, more inclined towards things like mathematics and, and logic. Others would be more inclined towards arts and language. So different people have different ways and different modes or different methodologies of understanding, right? So that's different for it. So intelligence, so everyone has the intellect. Intelligence is the ability of the intellect. That's what intelligence is. And different people have different intelligences and different levels. Now, stupidity doesn't mean there is a lack of, or there, there is no in intellect, or there is no, uh, uh, sorry. Yeah, there is no intellect or there is no intelligence. Stupidity means that intelligence is not being executed. So you say you call a person stupid when they are not using their aql. They're not being intelligent. They have intelligence, but they're not being intelligent. 
That's the lamp. Because you have the lamp and still you're sitting in darkness. Not only that, you're sitting in darkness and arguing a case uh, for your darkness, for being in that state. Huh? No, no, it's not dark. I can see, I can figure out. I know where things are. I can just feel them. You're sitting in darkness and you're arguing. That's compounded ignorance. You're ignorant about your ignorance. <laughs> you don't know that you're being ignorant. That's compounded ignorance. Yet you have the lamp. All it takes is for you to switch it on. And when you switch it on, what happens? There is luminance because the lamp now brightens the whole room and everything in it and everyone around you as well. So intelligence does not only benefit you, it benefits those who also come in contact with you, those who affiliate with you. Intelligence benefits others as well. This is why if you affiliate yourself to ignorant people, you will become ignorant. If you affiliate yourself to intelligent people, you will become intelligent. Because their luminance will fall on you. And on this side, their darkness is going to encompass you as well. So that's the misbah. What about the zujaja? The zujaja, the heart has been likened to glass because of the natural properties of glass. Glass is very brittle. It can break easily. Likewise, the heart can break easily. Glass in its, in its natural state is opaque and rough. You know where glass comes from? From sand uh, or soda ash, I believe they make it. With. There's sand and soda ash and stuff involved. It has to be processed. It has to be refined. It has to be cleansed. It has to be removed of impurity. It has to be polished. That's the nature of the glass. You polish the glass and you refine it until it becomes crystal clear. So that what? Light can pass through it. If it is opaque, light will not pass through it. And worse yet, it's going to cast a shadow on others. If an individual's heart is diseased, say you as, as the husband and the father, your heart is diseased, your heart is impure, you're not going to take in any light. And you're the head of the family. Likewise, you're then going to cast a shadow unto others, your wife and your children. You're going to be in darkness and you're going to submerge them in darkness. So when you cleanse your heart and you polish it and you refine it and you filter out any of these impurities and you shape it and you mold it, you give it this character, personality. You remove all these blemishes, the diseases. So that now it is so transparent that light can pass through it. And in its passing through, not only will it illuminate this lamp of intelli intelligence that's in you, but this light passing through the heart will also sh fall on others. It's going to illuminate others. So it's not just you. You are now a conduit. You are now a conduit of that light. You are part of this transmission of that light. That's the nature of the heart. That is the zujaja. It's like this brilliant pearl. It doesn't just receive the energy to glow. By it glowing in the same way that a star or a sun would glow, it casts that light unto others. It illuminates others. You see? Then he says that its source is not self-illuminating. Its source, the source of this heart, its luminance is not from itself. It has to come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. From this tree of purity. Which is why we say that and if you liken this tree of purity to be revelation, okay, if you liken it to be revelation, 
then and and we say that the heart must have this intimate connection with the Quran. So and if the Quran is pure because it's the speech of Allah and it's pure, la raiba fi, there's no raib in it. There is no iwaj in it. It is pure. You have to have this intimate connection. But if it is pure, you cannot be in a state of impurity. La yamassuhu illa al-mutahharun. None can touch its essence except those who are purified. You see? So there has to be this connection, which is why if there are blemishes on the heart, if there are these spots, part of it is clean, part of it is dirty, and the nature of the heart is what? Is it, why is it called Qalb? Because it's always changing. It's, it's shifting. It's changing its states. It's turning all the time. So sometimes there's light, sometimes there's no light. Right? It's coming in and then it's blocked off by a blemish. And then there's some clarity. So the light is always coming. But if the heart is blemished, it will it'll always be shifting. It's always going to be in doubt in turbulence. Sometimes there's clarity, sometimes there's no clarity. Then you are in a state of anxiety. This is how now these things start developing. The depression, you become unhappy, you become, uh, life is not fulfilling, my life sucks, my, you know, this. This is where these things come from. They're coming in from the heart. Because there are blemishes on the heart, there are these diseases on the heart that are doing what? Mana, they are preventing you the being which is inside this heart. I wish I had a glass sphere. I could maybe put a candle inside and we could use that as a demonstration. <laughs> Next time, inshallah. But think about that. If you cover the sphere, inside there is the candle, it's going to suffocate. Its light is useless. And whatever illumination you want to give it is useless. Right? If this heart is blemished and diseased, it becomes, it prevents the blemishes and the diseases. They prevent you from seeing, seeing, and this is the nature of light. How do you see, as Ibn Haytham said, for the external eyes? The revelation, the light has to come on the object that is to be revealed, then it, you will be able to see it. So if the light itself is trying, but it can't come, it's being blocked off, that prevents you from seeing Al-Haq. It prevents you from seeing the truth. You will not have this connection with the divine. The connection becomes severed. Now, does that mean just any Tom, Dick and Harry is going to merit the light from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? No. No. يَهْدِ اللَّهُ لِنُورِهِ مَنْ يَشَاءُ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chooses to guide his light unto whomsoever he wills. But before that, he says, نُورٌ عَلَى نُور That is the requisite for you to merit earning this light from Allah. نُورٌ عَلَى نُور There is one aspect of it in which the meaning of light upon light infinitum, just light, just continuous light. Light upon light. How much you can't even rationalize. That's one aspect of looking at it. The other aspect of that is, as the ulama say, it is the light of revelation of the light of the intellects. Light of revelation sitting in judgment over the light of the intellect. And this is the, the two streams of knowledge. What the intellect can acquire from sensoria, okay? And then what revelation comes and explains. And so revelation, we say, sits in judgment of a reason. Because you can go through the line of reasoning, the logic and the rationality. And as we say, your logic can be sound, but not necessarily true. The truth is affirmed by revelation. So revelation must sit in judgment of a reason. This is why I said earlier, using some harsh language, don't be a fool in saying, oh, the Quran is talking about Big Bang Theory. No. <laughs> the Quran is not talking about Big Bang Theory. The Quran is explaining to you haqiqa, 
of what transpired when he separated the heavens and the earth. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not say, Big Bang Theory, we are the ones who did it. That's not what the ayah says, does it? Don't use reason to sit in judgment of a revelation. This is what you do. And if you're not careful, you could be doing it and not realizing it. Because people do this. Oh, see, science is saying this now. Science tells us that this is what... Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends down a sign and says that when the sun rises from the west, on that day the doors of Toba will be closed to you. And so you have all these nutcases now going to try and rationalize the sign so that they can say, oh, see, I understood what others have not. See, science tells us that the earth is slowing down. And so then the earth is going to slow down and then it's going to turn the other way. Therefore, the sun will now rise from the west. This is what these idiots are doing. Using their sensoria, their reason to pass judgment over revelation. That's what you're doing. You don't realize it. You think you're being smart. But that's the nature of aqaliyah when it goes uncontrolled. When aqaliyah, so you have shahwa, you have ghadab, then you have aqal. Aqal itself can go out of control. We're going to talk about this in the next session, inshallah, or the one after, I believe. The one after that. Mm. When we talk about innam al-a'walum bin niyat. The aqaliyah can go out of control. And then it, now it supposes it knows everything about everything. And this is what you have, all these people with their... And see how confident they are. See how egoistic they are. See how proud and arrogant they are with knowledge. Oh, we know everything about... See, we have degrees. I have PhD. You can't argue with me. What is your Quran going to tell me? I have PhD. People get arrogant then. Oh, so this is what it, we, it, it means. Reason sitting in judgment over revelation. This is what people end up doing. They end up putting their own concoctions and then projecting it onto the revel onto what is being revealed. In doing so, they prevent themselves from seeing the truth. Because that, when you do that, that in itself is inherently a sign of a diseased heart. A sound heart will say, Sama'na wa wa'atana. We hear, listen, and we obey. Before you come to any rationality, we hear and we obey. When it manifests, then we'll understand what it is. That doesn't mean you can't try and figure it out. You can try and rationalize it, but don't use your sciencia or your sensoria to rationalize it. That's my point. Use revelation to come to the rationality. In epistemology, the foundation in Islam cannot be built using sensorial aspects. For instance, your epistemology must start as a foundation, the Quran, and all the requisite knowledges that go with the Quran, and then the Hadith, and all the requisite knowledges that go with the Hadith, and then the scholarly aspects, the, the scholarly inputs, and all the knowledges that go with that. Then you can go into reasoning and logic and rationality. But people have not studied any of those and they suddenly think that they have unraveled the secret of the Quran or the secret of the signs. Or I know what Dajjal is going to look like. Eh? I know when he's going to come. I did the calculation. <laughs> yeah, I did Abjad. That's the secret of the Quran, according to them. Abjad. <laughs> Alif Ba. Alif Ba Jim Dal. <laughs> Abijad, Hawaz, Hoktiya, all the characters. This is what they do. They don't want to study Arabic language, but they think they understood the speech of Allah, which is Quran and Arabian. Or we understand Quran, but you understand it without Arabic. <laughs> Let's see, this is the stupidity of these people. Because they are placing reason over revelation. No, if you follow the guidance of the Quran, Nurun ala Nur means revelation over reason. If you do that, then you put yourself in a maqam that says you are worthy 
of receiving the light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is when he says, يَهْدِ اللَّهُ لِنُورِهِ مَنْ يَشَاءُ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides his light and to whomsoever he wills. And thereafter then he says, وَيَضْرِبُ اللَّهُ الْأَمْثَالَ لِلنَّاسِ And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has presented this as an allegory and he presents such allegories so that you can understand. Because now, I guarantee you, most of these people who do this rationalistic approach of the Quran, projecting their own thoughts onto the Quran, they've never understood this ayah or they've never really come across it. Or if at all they have, they maybe just looked at an English translation and deduced nothing from it. When you begin to break it down, that's when things make sense. Because the Quran is one such kitab that... <laughs> See, contemporary literature or any other literature made by human beings, good literature has a complexity from the first surface. Surface analysis, tasawwar as When you read a book once, you do a tasawwar of it. It's such just an outward perception, an outward analysis. You get like a brief, like a grasping of, okay, what's the general concept about? When you do a second, third read now, and you start breaking it down now, you're going into the howness and the whether this and whether that, why is this, why is that? That's when things start breaking apart in literature. Now, good literature will maintain its integrity for as long as possible before it breaks down. This is why a lot of timeless pieces still endure to this day, because they're not easily broken up. A lot of the rubbish that comes out from young adult fiction nowadays is just shallow. It's so shallow and superficial that, well, I don't even read it because it's just not my game. But if you were to read that, you will find that it just breaks apart from the very beginning. This is why in highly intelli intellectual people or avid readers, when they read the, let's say, the first few paragraphs, they've already seen that it's not worth my time because it's already breaking down. There's no, it's not just about consistency. It's about death, depth, sorry, depth, and how much essence, essential knowledge is contained in it. On the other hand, when you look at revelation, revelation looks like it's already broken apart from the tasawwar of it. So when you read the Quran, and this is what I say, if you just read it passively, you're not going to get anything from it. But when you intellect now, when you start going deeper, you'll find that it doesn't actually break apart. It gets more and more stronger together. There, there are linkages now where you, so when you start at the surface, you'll find that there are pieces that are separated. But then now you go into the next line and you find that there's a connection. Then there are more connections. Then there are more, more connections and more connections and more connections. And it becomes a, a really a piece with substance the deeper you go into it. Because of this. You see? Because it's the nature of the speech of Allah is that it is meant to appeal to your intellect, but it is further meant to go deeper into your heart whereby these deeper connections are established. Now, this is Ayatul Nur. If you want to now connect with the Quran, you will now, you will now understand that it, what are you actually looking for? What's your heart looking for? When we say enlightenment, when we say the light of the Quran, when we say revelation, this is what it's talking about. It's this nur. This nur is not the light bulb or what's coming from the candle or the lantern or the fire. It's not that kind of nur. It's as one of my teachers always says, nur is not sold in the supermarket. 
<laughs> right? It's not something you acquire at a grocery store. It's not something you're going to get if you are going to be looking for convenience store kind of Islam. You know convenience store Islam or corner store Islam huh? or Walmart Islam or kiosk. <laughs> this that five minute Islam that people want. Two minute digestible clips that they can watch on Instagram. That is not going to grant you noor. This noor it has an active effort, not a passive effort. Or oh, in the morning while you're brushing your teeth, maybe you can watch a video clip of three minutes by Mufti Menk. That doesn't give you knowledge. Okay. Watching celebrity scholars on YouTube and Instagram and all these other media, whatever, is not going to give you the noor that your heart is looking for, the true noor. You have to be active in exerting the effort to reach that maqam where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you that noor. And that noor will begin only when there is sincerity in the heart. When the heart is sincere, that's the first step, the first mode of the cleansing process. This is why it is called Suratul Ikhlas. Ikhlas is the foundation. And we're going to talk about Ikhlas later on when we speak about Innamal A'malu Binniyat, the hadith from uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Ikhlas is the foundation, sincerity. Qul hu Allahu ahad, affirmation. Allahu samad, affirmation. Lam yalid wa lam yulad, affirmation. Wa lam yakun lahu kufu wa ahad, affirmation. If you are sincere, then that settles in the heart. That's the first aspect of Tawheed settling in the heart. That's the first truth, the principle, the first principle that settles into your heart. Then from there on now, every step that you take, so long as there is sincerity in that step, you will be brought closer and closer to that light you will begin to see and understand what others truly do not understand. And this is not going to be a wahmiya of sorts. It is going to be a kashf. This is what Imam al-Ghazali says is called uh, ilmul mukashafa, knowledge that is unveiled unto you. And it is not a knowledge that you can read about in books, that you can listen about in lectures that you can gather in, in just information, all right? It is not a knowledge that you will gather from this. It is a knowledge that if you were to even try and put it into words, you wouldn't be able to find the words to fit it. I guarantee you this. This is why a lot of that knowledge, a lot of the awliya who acquire that knowledge, they keep it secret, not because it should be kept a secret only, but because it can't be articulated. It's an understanding that takes place so deep within the heart that it is beyond the causal world. There are no words to describe it. Let's end here, inshallah. I'm very tired. And then we'll connect tomorrow, inshallah. I believe our topic for discussion tomorrow is going to be the Hadith of Jibril. So this will be an interesting one because I know most of you are familiar with the Hadith of Jibril. And, uh, Inshallah. We'll see you guys tomorrow. Let's end here. Subhanaka wa bihamdika nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Rabbana taqabbal minna innaka anta al-samiyun alim wa tubu alayna ya maulana innaka anta al-tawabu rahim bi rahmatika ya arhamar rahimin. Barakallahu fikum wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Ameen ya rabbal alameen. Jazakallahu khairan wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakallahu.